All right. Well, welcome everybody to Archive Dives with Ox and AI. This is a weekly series we put on where we dive into interesting research papers and machine learning and AI. So you can try to take some of the insights from the papers and see if you can apply them to your own work. If you're new here, welcome. Feel free to introduce yourself in the chat. We do it live every Friday with people all across the world, and we have a fun Discord you can join afterwards if you want to talk about the papers after we go through them. Today is a really fun paper from the team at Sakana AI. Uh, it's called Evolutionary Optimization of Model Merging Recipes. And the high level idea is that we have so many open weights models out there. Is there a world in which we just breed these open weights models together using an evolutionary algorithm and keep the fittest models and kind of kill off the other ones um, rather than continually training these things from scratch or trying to fine tune them for your use case. And it's a pretty crazy idea, but it seems to work pretty well. So excited to dive into all the details there. But before we do some quick background on us, Ox and AI is building a tool chain to help you collaborate and iterate on machine learning data sets like the ones used in this paper. So if you're running a lot of different experiments and have a lot of different versions of your data or models, I'd recommend you check us out. And Sakana, if you're watching, I feel like Oxen would have been a great uh, platform to run all of these experiments on. So perfect use case. If you're, if you're watching asynchronously, feel free to hit us up. Um, and in general, we'd love to have the researchers from these papers come to these live events. So if you're watching, um, the invitation is open. So this paper, like I said, evolutionary optimization of model merging recipes. It is hot off the presses. It came out like 10 days ago. Um, so really cutting edge stuff here. And the idea is what if you could improve a model's performance with minimal compute resources while leveraging all the open weights that other people have trained. Uh, and it's a pretty crazy idea. It reminds me of this guy right here. So crazy that it just might work. Um, and so this, uh, this paper is not only about model merging, but how do you merge models in while, while using an evolutionary algorithm to try to figure out what the best merges are. Um, so within the paper, there's some interesting links. Uh, there's this GitHub of this project called Merge Kit, um, where you can take any two models from Hugging Face and merge them through a variety of fashions. And we'll talk about what some of those ways are uh, throughout the talk here. Um, they have a nice blog post where they go through all of this as well. Um, but the merging part of model merging, they even call out in the paper, is a bit of black art or alchemy. It blows my mind that it even works at all. Um, there's some evaluations at the end of the paper that kind of break my brain of how, how well these models improve. Super interesting research and feels very approachable for anybody to try out um, with this merge kit repository, even if you don't have that much compute. Um, super interesting. You can do all these merges just on your CPU uh, and take like one 7 billion parameter model and another 7 billion parameter model. And I liked this meme that somebody posted of like the crazy names that you see on the Hugging Face leaderboard and you merge them together and you get another model <laughs> that has another crazy name. Um, but this whole process of model merging relies a lot on the model maker's intuition about which models to merge and how to merge them. And human intuition can only go so far. So this paper explores a systematic approach to discovering new model combinations. Um, and they reference the open LLM leaderboard a lot in this paper, if you guys aren't familiar with it. Uh, it's on Hugging Face. They have a list of the highest performing um, models out there. And a lot of these on this leaderboard are 
these model merges. Um, like for example, dare ties, if you ever see that, that's a model merging technique. Um, I'm sure we could find some other ones on here too, um, but not uncommon that these top ones are like merged models from, from the bottom ones. Um, and all of the code and the weights from their experiments in this paper are open source in the name of open science. So they have a GitHub right here with all the code that they used for, for this paper. So to kick off, there's a few different types of merging that you can do. Um, the most popular ones I've seen are just like a linear weighting weight averaging of all the weights in the model. This one probably doesn't work the best. You can just think of it as taking the parameters of one model and the other model and just averaging the weights. Um, there's also ones called slurp, which is short for a spherical linear interpolation. So a little smarter than your basic averaging. Then there's one called ties merging um, that looks at the signs of all of the weights, um, tries to only merge parameters that have uh, the aligning signs. And there's some interesting techniques. Full disclosure, I haven't read all of these other papers. So I was trying to just get a high level overview. And then there's one called DARE um, that's zeroing out small differences between a fine-tuned model and the original base model. So whenever you see DARE, that's like, you have to have the base model and a fine-tuned model um, and look at the differences between those to do the merge. So you might have like a base model and then one fine-tuned on math and one fine-tuned on uh, programming. And then you could merge the math one with the programming one, looking at the changes that happened from the base model. Um, so those are just some configurations that you might wanna keep in mind as you're going through here. And there's a whole Hugging Face blog post on the different types of model merging, um, the leaderboard and some code and uh, example configuration files for how to merge these models. So like you might have the base model here, uh, the other two models that you wanna merge and then some sort of parameters that you're looking at, like which layers you wanna merge and I honestly don't know what all these other values are, but that's where the evolutionary algorithm comes in. Um, and so all of these techniques rely, or many of the techniques rely on having the same model architecture. Like you start with a base llama or a base mistral, um, but there's other techniques that have been proposed that you could have models of different architectures or even like stacking up layers from a mistral or a llama into a much larger model. And they, people call these Franken merges. Um, and it's pretty trial and error, but pretty wild that that even works at all, um, taking layers from two different models and putting them together. Um, couple, so a lot uh, of different... Couple... Oh, yeah. Sorry, a couple of <laughs> chat questions when you get a chance. Um, the first one was, uh, does model merging increase or decrease input context window size? It sounded like from those parameter affecting methods you were talking about that that wouldn't really have an effect, um, but are there some architectures where it does? On the context context length? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, usually context length really depends on like the data that the model was trained on and how efficient that model is. So I could see mm -hmm. if you had one model that was trained on a much larger context context length and you merged that with one that was smaller, it could pick up some of those um, characteristics because like the context length is really just how it learns those embeddings in the in the first, like the positional embeddings of where to look. Um, so I think it's possible, but they didn't talk about that explicitly in this paper. Got it. Um, and then another question on uh, which I think is getting into what you're talking about with the Franken merges. Models can be merged only if they have the same or similar architecture slash number of parameters, right? Um, so for a lot of these techniques, yes, but some of the techniques, no, you could actually take two different models um, 
with different architectures and like pick and choose the layers that you stack on top of each other, um, which is pretty wild, but it doesn't have to be the same architecture. Got it. Thanks. Yep. Great questions. Um, so building on top of that, the goal is to create a framework for merging that results in the merged model surpassing the performance of each individual model. Um, and they had a nice little GIF here of, say, you have model A, model B, and model C. Uh, there's kind of two different ways that you could merge these models. Say they had three different layers in each one of them. Um, one is just to take the layer and directly put it into the new model. And then the other one is to kind of take um, the three different models and merge the parameters from each layer. So this one, they just took the layer straight up. This one, they merged them and put that block in there. Um, and they kind of, they have a diagram in the paper that's the same thing, but not moving. <laughs> So we can look at it a little better. Um, but they call these two approaches. One is merging in parameter space. So they call that merge in PS. And that's kind of like uh, they say this type of merging is akin to blending colors, uh, like blending paint colors um, and merging the weights. So that's kind of what you see in this red and blue turns into like some level of purple, depending on how you merge the weights. And then there's merging in uh, data flow space is the second type. So this would be taking an entire block from one transformer and putting it in to the other one. So you're just like copying all of the weights in that case. And they say these two approaches are orthogonal to each other. So like you can do both within the same merge. And that's what they end up doing here is sometimes they merge in parameter space. Sometimes they merge in data flow space. Um, and you kind of get this model that comes out that has both like linearly interpolated blocks and just straight up copies that are stacked on top of each other. Um, so what's the difference between the parameter space and the data flow? Uh, parameter one is pretty intuitive based off of these things that we talked about at, at the top, but the data flow one took a second for me to wrap my brain around. Um, so they say the data flow space looks at the inference path that each token takes as it traverses through the network. Um, so if you remember from our transformer deep dives, uh, you might have different um, different attention blocks learning different types of things about the sentence. So you might have like one attention block that looks at uh, mathy type stuff and one attention block that looks at some other things. So they're saying what they do is while they're doing these merges, they look at which parameters are activated for a given sentence in your test set. Um, and they try to grab the portions of the model that are really optimized for that type of sentence. And they'll just put that subset of the weights into the new model. Um, and so that's kind of what this data flow space looks like is they're looking at how actual data flows through the transformer and picking the the paths based on that. Um, so yeah, combination of ideas there and a lot of different ways you could imagine combining these models together. Um, so and so this is where the evolutionary algorithm comes in because evolutionary al algorithms are ideal for settings in which you don't necessarily have a ground truth set of ac actions to take. Um, so for example, in this scenario, we don't know the exact parameter merges that would lead to an optimal model. So in this paper, they use an algorithm that's called the CMAES algorithm, covariance matrix, ad matrix adaptation. 
evolutionary strategy. Uh, it's just a strategy for numerical optimization in general, but is great for um, when you don't know exactly which steps you need to take to, to go in the right direction. Um, and so if you're not familiar with the CMA ES algorithm, um, there's a nice little diagram that we can kind of walk through from Wikipedia here. Um, but the idea is you start by creating a population of models. So this could be like all of the models on the open LLM leaderboard. Um, and then you create this loop where you take each model within the population um, and you evaluate it in an environment. So in this case, they take a thousand examples from a, all of these experiments were run in Japanese. So it was like a Japanese math uh, type, type data set. Um, and they run this data set through each one of the models in the population and compute the accuracy for each one. Um, then they breed the model weights um, and create new members of the population. Um, and this breeding step could be like a variety of the merging techniques that we saw above. Um, in traditional, like CMA, ES, you can also add some randomness in this step, uh, either to like, the randomness can come from like which layers you're choosing, but also I think it would be interesting to like add some randomness to the weights themselves, um, as long as you don't just like completely destroy the model. Um, but the key step at the end here is you take all of these merges and see how they did on the training data set that you had, and you kill all the ones uh, that performed poorly and keep all the ones that performed highly. And what kind of happens um, and this is in a much higher dimensional space than we're seeing here, but you might start with your whole population over here. As you merge the models, they kind of spread out and like some of them get closer to a better accuracy. Some of them might get farther away and you end up like killing all these ones, starting with these ones again, merging them. They might get more spread out and then eventually they start clustering, 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 and hopefully by the end, you get the best models with the best accuracy um, in the final generation. So that's kind of the high level idea behind the CMA ES algorithm. Um, and what's crazy when they do this, um, they test this on math reasoning, like I said, in Japanese, um, but the data set is actually very similar to the GSM 8K one in English. Um, so what that one looks like is you have a bunch of prompts uh, with math word problems. So like Natalia sold 48 of, sold clips to 48 of her friends, blah, blah, blah. How many clips did she sell all together? Um, and then each one of these has some reasoning, um, some mathematical reasoning, and then a answer at the end. So that's the GSM 8K data set in English. They have an equivalent one in Japanese that they use. Um, but that's kind of what they're benchmarking this all again. Um, did you, did so, you translate it? Or is it an already translated version of it? Uh, so GSM 8K is the English version, and then they have one called like MGSM that is a Japanese version of it that I don't know how they generated that, but it's the equivalent type of problems. Um, so what they do is they take these three, or they took these three models. Um, this one is a Japanese model, and these two are actually English math models. Um, and so these are like the ones that they start with in this algorithm. They're all seven, seven billion parameter models. And you can see pretty poor accuracy to start 
on this task. Um, and so they do a couple different iterations. They do just the parameter space merging um, with the evolutionary algorithm, and that gives them a huge boost in accuracy. Um, I think later in the paper, they said they had a population size of 128, and they ran it for 100 generations um, to get these results. They did some evolution studies of just doing the um, data. What was DFF? What did DFF stand for again? Data flow space. Um, they did the data flow space here. And data flow space is interesting because if you remember from those diagrams above, uh, you can actually take weights from both of the models and end up with a larger model. So the parameter space one, you're going to end up with a model of the same size, but data flow space, you might end up with a model that's larger than any of the two that you started with. Um, and that gave them a reasonable bump in accuracy above all of the original ones. Um, but then they did an experiment with parameter space and data flow space. And that one just kind of blew all three of them out of the water and even took some of these 7 billion parameter models um, and beat GPT 3.5 on the math benchmarks. Um, and as well as blew some of these 7 billion parameter models out of the water with much smaller models. So this was part of the paper that just kind of blew my mind was this simple evolutionary algorithm of like merging the models, evaluating them, on a data set that you're optimizing for, like math, um, you don't have to do any training in this scenario. You're just model merging on CPU. And like, sure, you have to run inference on the models as well, but you're not doing a full training can get you from 9% accuracy to 55% accuracy. Uh, it's kind of wild that that works at all. Um, and from the blog post, when they get to this step, they talk about how this kind of serendipity is a common recurring theme in our explorations when applying evolution to foundation models. As we'll later see, evolutionary algorithms naturally just want to work. <laughs> We're able to obtain successful results when attempting to apply the approach to other areas such as visual language models and diffusion language models, even at the early stages of experimentation. So these experiments they ran were all in the LLM space of trying to improve math, but you could just as easily apply these same techniques to um, visual language understanding or even generative models to build better diffusion models. So super interesting and super early uh, in terms of trying out these techniques. Um, so that's pretty exciting. I think there's even interesting room to play for like having humans in the loop for scoring. Um, so you have apps like the LLM Sys boxing gym where humans rank these models. Um, and they even mentioned some related work that came out around the same size called auto merge that takes two random models from the top 20 models on the open LLM leaderboard, applies <clears throat> the spherical linear interpol interpolation and the dares tie method to create new models. And then eventually some of those models will make it back into the top 20 of the LLM leaderboard. And you could just run this iteratively and we have humans in the loop ranking them. Um, so people are already trying this type of technique without having to train any of the models. Pretty interesting. Um, let's see. And then finally, they do mention some limitations of the method. Uh, one is just knowing what was in the original training data. Um, so they say one may think that it is more natural that this technique would translate to the GSM 8K1 in English that we saw, but they said 
through their pre preliminary efforts, this approach did not work very well because the open source math models were already trained on GSM 8K. Um, and so they the main takeaway here is you kind of have to run this process on a data set that these models weren't trained on initially. Um, it's kind of hard to know, even with some of the open source models, um, which is why I think the open LLM leaderboard and like an L LLM boxing type scenario where you're constantly getting new data in, new prompts in, and having humans evaluate them is super interesting. Um, and the other thing they talk about is just inheriting the weaknesses from the models as well as the strengths. So uh, while the evolutionary merging does integrate some diverse expertise, it also inherits all the poor things about those models. Um, so there might be additional steps one might have to take after the merge to really get the model behavior that they want. Um, like you might want to do a DPO training after you do the model merging, um, if you're concerned about uh, controlling what really comes out of the model. But overall, super interesting. I'm curious if anybody here has run any model merges themselves. I didn't have time to do it this week, but I think it would be really fun to like grab some of these models. I feel like the biggest bottleneck would be the time to download the models um, and just the disk space it would take to do all of this, but curious if anyone's tried or what other people's thoughts are. Yeah, uh, Evan. Yeah, Greg, I'm wondering, do you remember a while back, like a few months ago, I showed you um, a model merging strategy that was essentially using cross attention uh, across the uh, blocks? Yeah. Uh, like I don't the... think anyone's tried that still. And I feel like essentially you get to like learn the best way to communicate between the blocks as opposed to randomly selecting them. Totally. I think there's some interesting like dynamics between the mixture of experts routing and like learning the merges yeah. themselves. There was another idea I had that I think would be even simpler actually, which would be to essentially use um, one of the transformer blocks to predict like two rows of activations and use the as like a LoRa uh, parameter. So like you essentially predict the uh, the deltas to the other transformer blocks' uh, weights in yeah. a lower end space. Um, yeah, so that way they can kind of like they can kind of interrupt each other uh, through some sort of information constrained mechanism. Mm. Yeah, I I'm curious if people I'm sure somebody's working on this, but like applying those dare or ties methods to the LORAs themselves rather than the full models feels like yeah, it it's also like work at, at inference predict activations that are essentially the LORA parameters for the other model mm. and then just fine tune like that. Yeah, totally. Love that idea. Um, yeah. Anybody else have intuitions here or thoughts or worked on evolutionary type stuff? It's just that the evolutionary stuff, in my experience, is just way too inefficient. The search space like has to be constrained down so effectively. Mm -hmm. Like if when I went through this paper, I my my kind of excitement gradually decreased the more I read <laughs> it, um, because a lot of it was just oh we use this heuristic or that heuristic and that bounded our search space effectively. So, and you know I I get the sense that people are trying to bring more rigor to optimizing these model merges, right? Because, you know, people are just cluttering and putting things together and hoping things work. And here we're kind of still doing that, except we're letting this evolutionary strategy take the brunt of that. Um, the main, I think, difficulty is that if you think about the small world of benchmarks that you're evaluating these models against, it's just not clear um, what that's really doing, right? Because like a lot of people have been using task vectors or something else, which is essentially trying to fine tune one model or one model's subset of tunable parameters down on a specific benchmark or task. But as you're tuning that model towards it, it's conceivably imaginable that the model's performance on other tasks is also changing too, right? 
So that yeah. task factor isn't really representing one task, but rather a family of tasks and how correlations between those tasks might impact performance too. Long story short, this means that I think one other bottleneck is if you're going to use as a reward function or loss function, some aggregation of performance metrics across all these downstream tasks for benchmarks, that's going to be really inefficient, right? Because you're going to have this LLM going or whatever other large foundation revision model going through each one of these benchmarks, even for just one single epoch or one single pass, trying to get some, sig some signal for how to update its weights if it's linear interpolation merging or even for slurp for the T parameter or something else, right? Yeah, and that's even when I like started, I had the same sentiment when I started reading, I was like, oh, you could run all of this in theory on your CPU, like the model merging itself, but the inference time it would take to run all of the experiments mm -hmm. across a bunch of different benchmarks would be the real bottleneck there. And they even mentioned in their blog post that they got like a big grant from the Japanese government that allowed them to scale their ideas to national GPU supercomputing cluster in Japan. So oh, that's like the, one of the top 50 <laughs> computers or something. Um, I think yeah. I checked. So yeah, money helps. Yeah, I, totally. I want to comment, uh, like, it seems like this is one of those papers where it's like, we got a shitload of money and decided to spend it.com. And, uh, I think what's interesting is, um, I had a research group approach me about, um, alpha geometry, which is another paper we went over a while back. And they saw the value in it as essentially allowing you to generate these constraints for this search base. So like if you can generically take problems and then bound them, um, it's kind of like what the evolutionary algorithm is doing in a sense, like you're creating a heuristic to guide a highly dimensional search space. Um, and if you can mathematically create some constraints on that search for any arbitrary problem using alpha geometry, then an algorithm like this becomes a lot more approachable because you know like which 90% of the paths you can discard. Um, so I, I feel like this type of strategy will be viable in the future, but right now you literally need an entire government support to try it. <laughs> yeah, totally. Well, to try it at the scale they did. What's interesting also, I guess, with the open LLM leaderboard is like everybody and this is kind of doing this in a distributed fashion on their own. So it's almost like, we have the supercomputer of the oh, open yeah. source commu community doing it. <laughs> You're using the uh, the collective intelligence of the entire internet there for yep. free. Yeah. So I wonder if you could do a evolutionary model merge using that open uh, like that leaderboard. Like we just use one of these calls to just start rating responses, and like <laughs> at the end we just have like the top model because we didn't have to hire Japan's government to give us a mega GPU. I would, I would love to do a project like that, even, even within Oxen to like collect prompts and iterate on them and evaluate them on models and just like store all the results there. Yeah. We already got the impossible questions. We do the unanswerable questions. I love Cameron was literally going around with flipboards collecting those. Uh, so she still needs to put them into Oxen, but apparently she ran into Jan Lacoon. I know. Didn't know who he was. Seriously? Didn't know who he was. Did we get it? Did we, did we get a, um, did we get an unanswerable question from Jan? We might have, but what was so funny was she was like, I didn't know who this guy was. He just looked like he needed somebody to talk to. And that was the week that we were doing iJeppa. And then <laughs> after we did iJeppa, she was like, oh, that's who I was talking to? And I was like, oh, that is a missed opportunity. <laughs> Cameron, if you're watching ASIC, we love you. You're, you're out on the field just finding all these people naturally. <laughs> <laughs> finding Jan Lacoon. Yeah. Well, the cool. thing that was most interesting to me was your allegory analogy to uh, like doing DNA mutation to the model weights. Because I feel like there's a world in which like, let's assume we have infinite compute, which I know is an unreasonable assumption, but let's assume we have infinite compute. You could just take like GPT 3.5 or Mistral 7B or you name the model and just That's perturb its weights true. slightly, do a hundred of those random perturbations and then eval all a hundred and take only the top 10 i.e like natural selection and just do that infinitely until you have evolved a model that mm -hmm. performs better on evals than any existing model like i feel like theoretically that's possible that, that's what it's, neats is uh 
that's how I got into machine learning. Actually, there's a Seth Bling video where he teaches Mario how to play Mario by by doing random per perturbations to the architecture and model weights. Oh, interesting. There was oh, oh. that even reminds me of I wanted to pull up this video. Um, let's see. Like, I just want to, like, spin up, like, a little version of this with Mistral 7B and just, like, set it off to run on, like, a local computer or something. Like, it'll cost me my energy bill. I'll just come back, like, 10 years later and see what I have. <laughs> that would be fun. Um, this was a, a fun one that they did just showing, like, these evolutionary algorithms in process. But they were having these different types of geometries trying to turn into a car and move eventually. And they're just putting wheels on random places on different geometries and have this surface. And eventually you start getting things that can <laughs> go farther than the original ones with some pretty like, hilarious designs. Frustratingly, I feel like all these methods suffer from the same fundamental problem. Essentially, this is like a really, 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 really inefficient way of doing reinforcement learning. And pretty much like, 90% of doing reinforcement learning is like tuning your heuristics so that it doesn't come up with some exploit that like does some really, really uh, poor behavior, like memorizing all the examples or, or finding a glitch in your simulation that it exploits. Yeah, totally. Yeah, I love when the video game ones will be like, oh, I'll just learn to face through the wall, you know? <laughs> that's that's <laughs> all I need to be able to do. Wait, but then wouldn't an evolutionary style model solve that since there's no heuristics and there, there's nothing then to solve because it's random so like no, it can't the, name the system the evolutionary optimization you have a uh, a function that essentially defines how good that specimen is and then you so you essentially say like all right who can run the furthest and then you take the top five people that run the furthest and then they you like make them have sex and then you make little babies and then you like rate the babies but it all depends right. on the so What you're saying is if, if one does better on the eval because of an exploit, then that is the one that will propagate. Yeah, it will kill all of the actual ones that were doing something. So it, it basically suffers from mode collapse. That's truly survival of the fittest. It's gamed the eval system to survive. Yeah, there were some like NVIDIA, um, like hide and seek evolutionary RL stuff. And essentially what they did is they just started figuring out how to glitch themselves out of bounds. So the seekers could never find the hiders because they like escaped the simulation. Basically, That's it was really right. sick. I think, I think we have a hand, Greg. I don't know if you can. Yeah, Shalini. Oh, sorry. Um, I just wanted to ask a question. I perhaps this is within your Oxen um, documentation. So some of the data I'm looking at is. Um, GDPR, so there are some security issues. So this is related to health um, and private. So um, I, I want to work with Oxen, but I just also want to make sure I don't cause a ruckus by, you know, <laughs> putting in this data set. So um, I didn't want, I didn't know if it was appropriate to discuss this openly in Discord. So I just want to put it out there and ask this question since it's likely other people um are also working with sensitive data sets so thank yeah. you yeah well thanks for asking the question uh we're currently doing some uh private deployments into uh customers on vpcs like we have a biotech company that has data along those lines um so that's one option uh and then the other one is we have private repositories as well so like it really depends on your security requirements there but like if you're just concerned about the broader community not seeing them, there's like public and private repositories that we could make. It's so uh, just to be precise, uh, there are, uh, I guess, uh, corporations who do not have a precise security requirements, but they're like, this has to be super secure, like nobody has to hack into them. How can you ensure us that nobody can hack into them? This is a very strange question. This is something that we're dealing with. Um, so I, I think this is, I, I. it's likely I'll see you guys in San Francisco next week. Um, I'm a UC San Diego alumnus. So I'm part of the SoCal vibe. I like to think cool. so, but um, just putting it out there. So I'll probably see you guys if you see me. Yes. Please say hello. <laughs> we'll find, we'll, yeah, please. we'll seek you out. 
Yeah, please say, uh, yeah, please say hi. It's definitely some stuff that we can work on with you. Thank you, Scott. Thanks for the question. Awesome. Well, I'll, I'll kill the recording here just in case there's any other questions we want to dive into. Um, and if if uh, you have paper ideas, feel free to put them in the Discord um, and feel free to sign up for Oxen and, and kick the tires. We're looking for as many beta users as possible. So thanks, y'all.